Today's episode is sponsored by William and Lauren. If you've checked out our website, voicefirstworld.com, or any of our social media, you'll see that JRT and I are wearing custom blazers. We call it the Confidence Blazer, complete with our own logo liner. We love these blazers. William and Lauren Company creates made to measure clothing that captures your personality and unleashes your confidence. If you've never had custom clothing before, let me tell you, it is a game changer. They believe you don't have to spend a million bucks to look like it. They work with both men and women, but men are no strangers usually to at least some kind of customization in their suits. Women, this is pretty rare. Check them out at williamandlauren.com. They'll jump on a call with you, do a Zoom measurement, and get you a custom blazer, a custom suit in about four to six weeks' time. William and Lauren, the personal shopper you never knew you needed. Hello, welcome to the Speak With Presence podcast, where perfection is overrated, good guys listen, and women speak up to influence change. I'm Jen Valenga, co-founder of Voice First World. And I am JRT, also known as Jennifer Retley Thomas, and we're also co-host of the Speak With Presence podcast. We're here live. We are on our Facebook group, Powerful Women Speakers, and we're also on YouTube. And I'm very excited about today, JRT. I mean, I want to get to this because I feel like the next 30 to 45 minutes is comedy hour. Today's guest is Susan Bott. Susan Bott, you may not think you know her, but you know her. I know you know her because you've seen her all over your TV before. She's an amazing actor and voiceover artist, a comedian, and an owner of Room Tonic. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But the thing that's interesting to me about performers is that they all know, they may not have business degrees, but they know all about startups because every new role is a new startup. Every new play, every new comedy sketch you put together is a startup. So when I hear that performers have gone on to start their own businesses and become their own owners, founders, presidents of their own organizations, it makes sense to me because we all understand startups and people and business from a very organic and intuitive way. And this is Susan Bott. I met Susan in undergrad, long before I went to grad school for directing and started this company and was a professor and all the things. Susan and I were young babes in undergraduate school. Hottie toddies. Hot, we were, we were hottie toddies. She's still a hottie toddy, let me tell you what. So we uh, were actors together and we had a lot of fun. You got to meet Susan before we bring her on in from the green room. What do you have to say? I have three very specific stories I need her to share today. Three. She knows what they are. Okay. okay. And uh, I'd mm-hmm. like to say every time I'm going to be, the people will be surprised by these stories. I mean, I just think about the one we just released with Courtney's stories. She's going to add a whole new flair. I mean, this could be a top selling podcast today because of her. <laughs> That's even such a thing. <laughs> we, they, she has amazing stories and she knows how to tell a story. So before we bring, you know what? Yeah. Uh-huh. Before we bring her on, let's, let's share a little special surprise for Subot. Susan Bott. Hmm. How would I describe Susan Bott? Susan Bott is, <laughs> well, she's infectious, not in a COVID way, but in all the best possible ways. Her kindness, her generosity, her vibration, her, her energy, her laugh. She just puts it all out there for everyone else just to have. And she doesn't expect anything in return. She's wise and she is a very loyal friend and she will fight till the bitter end for what she believes in. And I really wish that there were more people like Susan Bott on this earth. Okay. That was from Rona. And I'm going to bring Susan on. Are you trying to do me? Are you kidding me? Uh-oh. We just like to let you know how amazing you are. You don't hear it enough. No, my second grade teacher is here. <laughs> we don't have your second grade teacher. Sorry about that one. But we do have Rona, who's almost like. Yes, you've almost known yeah. her as long as second grade. That's it as feels serious like. as this gig's going to get today. <laughs> Good, but I'm no, I'm very excited. I mean, I've heard Jen talk about you for I don't know how long, and I can't wait for this audience to learn more about you. Oh, thank you. 
Susan, tell us, give us a little, tell us um, where you are right now, where you're sitting, uh, where you're coming to us from, and then we're going to get into the story about Steve right away, and we'll take it from there. Okay. I am in my dining room in Marblehead, Massachusetts, which is about 20 miles north of Boston, with my three dogs, and uh, getting ready to go to work later. And what's work for you? I own Room Tonic, which is a home decor shop here in Marblehead. It was my interior design company in New York City, and I moved up here. Um, I was an actor in New York City and then later a designer because there's so many roles for perimenopausal women. Yes. And when I moved <laughs> when I moved up here, I was like, okay, what am I going to do? And my now husband was just like, well, you already have a company. Let's just do something with it. And the uh, rental property literally just like came into our life and I didn't have a plan. I didn't have uh, a, a business plan. I didn't think about even, you know, opening a shop was kind of brought to me and um, we signed the lease on July 11th and like opened September, August 30th. And we were literally pulling things out of my house. Going, we, can sell this, we can sell this. And, and then we, um, we started getting awards. Um, and uh, then five months in COVID happened. So we then went to sleep for a little bit and worked on roomtonic.com and at room tonic decor, on the Instagram. And uh, and then we won some more awards and here we are. You have to get into Steve a little bit about being in New York City and pulling together some comedy and, you know, all of that. But we want to hear about Steve. Ready, go. Okay. When I was in New York City, I was uh, part of an all-female uh, sketch comedy group. And uh, there were uh, there was another woman in the group and I that really clicked and did most of the writing and, and higher up said, you two should go do something. So in our time taking gigs throughout Manhattan, we saw firsthand how women were treated less than, how women were considered not funny, even though we would get more laughs or whatever. There's just this stain on um, female comics. And um, so when this other person and I decided to form a duo, we decided to name our duo Steve. And we would say, yeah, Steve needs two mics. Um, Steve, yeah, well, Steve will take the midnight slot. That's great. That's great. We were getting better sl slots, uh, better gigs, all that stuff. And and we'd show up and they like, who are you? We're like, and at, simultaneously, we're like, Steve, we're Steve. They're like, wait, what? We're like, yeah. And they came back out because they booked us, you know, but we just thought it was very interesting at how surprised people would be when two women showed up saying they're Steve. And I was like, you'll get it when you're a woman. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, and I said, the world is a different place when you have a vagina, my dear. So get us the mics and, you know, we're going to we're going to entertain your crowd. And 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 it was good because I think that kind of sass is needed and not not to be a bitch or anything. You know, I would I would um, I don't know. I could, you know how in the South they're like, bless your heart, you know, that kind of thing. I would just be like, you're adorable thinking women can't be funny, you know, and just try and try and give my message in a way of like, you really need to re-examine how you're running your club. But you're in good company because the, there's writers from the beginning of time, artists of all, women always wrote under pen names. It's still happening. Oh, yeah. What, what about with your with room tonic? Do you feel you get any gender bias there or is there something about um, no, not, home decor that maybe it's the business owner part? No, not so much. Well, first of all, room tonic carries mostly women owned things. Ah, love that. And if they're not women owned, they're family owned. So I, I take great effort to find women owned uh, companies and carry their products. I, I, I think it's it's fair to say 90 percent. Um, and which I enjoy and, and mm -hmm. yeah, I try and find women owned businesses, even for, you know, I just bought a cardigan the other day from a small business that's women owned. The bias that I've seen has been with contractors, electricians, stuff like that, people on job sites. I was <clears throat> working uh, on the Food Network for a show called American Diner Revival. And it was a show with uh, Ty Pennington. I was his design coordinator and we were in Detroit because we toured America and mm -hmm. tore down the diner and rebuild it. And so many men that were the contractors, all that stuff, wanted to talk to Ty about things. And I was like, sweetie, Ty is the talent. He is in his trailer. 
I'm going to, <laughs> this is what I do. And then I call the talent and say, flash your pearlies, bang the hammer three times, and then go back to your trailer. You know, the, and the war, like the, the general, general society just doesn't understand that, you know, he is the host. He's, he's not breaking a sweat. And there was one guy who, who just was like in my face and, then, and I was just, I stayed so calm. He, one of my favorite quotes, everybody, it's a Buddhist quote and I'm going to it loosely translate it is when the crazy man yells, don't yell back because no one will know who the crazy one is. Mm. So this guy was losing his mm -hmm. And I just stood there and, you know, I, I, and I just waited and I was like, are you done? He's like, yes. I said, okay, get back to work. We have a TV show to make and I have a deadline to make, you know? And it was very funny that we, we had a lot of volunteers that were from the people of the town and stuff like that. They're like, oh my God, are you okay? Are you like hugging me? I'm like, oh, all in a day's work. work. You know, I, still like, day. I said, this is like, I call this Tuesday, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think working in, in New York city, long enough, you get thick skinned. And I had to, with a lot of my um, things that needed to be done, I would literally, I would call my husband or my brother and just say you work for me and say this needs to be done, please, because this jerk is not doing it. Da, 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 da. And, and they would like, what? I'm like, just do it. You know, as I said, the world is a different place when you have a vagina, mm -hmm. you know, there's for whatever reason. Um, and, and that was really frustrating that I had to get people who didn't even know what they were talking about. Wait, you so know? you called your brother to say, what are the words I should use? Or you were like, here. No, no, no. I called my brother and said, will you call this oh my contractor God. and oh my God. say, we need this done and blah, 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 and blah, 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 because I had already said it. And they're treating me like, you know, give me a little Cindy Lou Who. Okay. Like, you don't know what you're oh doing. Oh my gosh. Oh Yeah. Yeah, that's true. We hear it all the time. We hear it all, all the time. The freaking time. Yeah. So, so that's the kind of stuff that, that uh, enough years of that, you, you get tired. And, and I, I adore that. My shop is owned by me and my husband does all the back of the house and all that stuff. So it is our shop, but he respects the fact that I'm a woman who started my own business and it is, it is my name. It is my baby. He's like, it's her business. Her, it's a woman-owned business. It is hers. And I help her. We had a guy come to do a 360 of the shop for a certain search engine online. And the guy was late and we weren't ready. You know, we, we he said it's going to be an hour and then he shows up, you know, we weren't ready was the point. And he missed a, a, a certain thing that we wanted. And he's like, ah, it's fine. It's fine. And we're like, wait, 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 wait. He's like, I got another appointment to go to. And I was like, wait, wait we waited like two extra hours for you, but you're going to wrap us up so you can be on time to the next one. I'm like, I don't think so. And this guy started talking over me. And I, then I was like, don't yell back, don't yell back. I was like, excuse me, I'm speaking. Excuse me. I'm spe you're talking over me. Excuse me. I have something to say, you know, and I just kept my cool. And I said, listen, in the time that you have been arguing with me, you could have been doing your job and on your way. So now you've created more time for you to be late because you decided to have an argument with me. So let's do the retake and you'll be out of here in five minutes, you know? And I, I don't know. It pisses me off so badly that you have to, you have to get to that point, but you do, yeah. you do. And I think it's just a matter of women learning to um, know their worth yeah, and not be afraid of someone telling them off. You know, go practice, go start some fights with people and just you know, not, yeah. practice, you know, but be comfortable with speaking up because some people will say, I say starting fights, not literally in that sense. I mean, figuratively, because so many women in their minds will think that speaking up for themselves is starting a fight or it's conflict or it's not. It's stating something. It's setting a boundary. It's speaking your mind or asking for what you want, you know, and, and so I think um, explore starting a fight, meaning stand up for yourself, say something that you want to, to get that muscle honed and, and strong. Cause it does, it takes, a, it takes a lot of time. And once you're in your fifties, you're like, yeah, you screw, you can screw up. Well, <laughs> you just JRT wouldn't know anything about that, but I'm with you girl. I'm oh, with you. Our little lamb. lamb. Yeah. But there, there is, you know, I remember when my, my mother died when I was 35 and she said, I'm so pissed. I'm you in your 40s and 50s. I said, why? She goes, 
you know who your friends are, you know who your friends aren't, you can tell people that off and your Christmas card list gets a lot smaller. <laughs> that is so true. It's so true. It's so true where I like, especially after COVID too, I was like, I'm very choosy with whom I spend my time. Yep. How about the Japan story is a good one. You messaged me about this, by the way. Yeah, I did. When you guys first started this, I was like, this is a good story. So a guy I know was up for a job in Tokyo. Big big banking things I don't know. And uh, he hired a tutor to help him teach him Japanese and was working with this woman for, I think, a good four months. And he was pretty much fluent. So he flew to Tokyo to meet, and it was, in his mind, it was like, it's a formality. It's a done deal. They have been courting me for so long and talking to my headhunter or whatever that this is kind of probably like the, the handshake and let's hire you. So he went there and they didn't offer him the job and he's confused. He's like, well, maybe, maybe they're going to wait and they're going to get back to me or maybe they're, you know, and no offer came and, and he uh, talked to his headhunter and said, like, what's going on? He's like, yeah, I just heard from them. They said uh, they, they can't hire you because you talk like a woman. And here's the thing. In Japan, the women speak differently than the men. So he was taught by a woman, Japanese. And so, the, it, it, for an example, um, I, he, he was saying, like, a man would say, like, I need that on my desk tomorrow morning. Whereas a woman <clears throat> would say, if it would be pleasing to you and if it wouldn't bother you or trouble you, I would appreciate it so much if by tomorrow, tomorrow morning or at your earliest convenience, I could be honored with that paper on the, you know, like, like this whole uh, uh, kind of stuff. And I guess that's what he did. And it, it, they were just like, dude, you know, grow a pair. Just grow a pair, grow a pair. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So I thought that was, I was like, God, that's. Yeah. But it, it just totally highlights language because it happens in the U S too, but it doesn't have the same kind of hierarchical class structure. I, well, sub, in the subtext it does, but not overtly like it does there. That's such a fascinating story. And there are, there are so many women that I hear too, speaking of vocal quality, oh. I'd love for women out there to really get used to their lower register and know that sometimes when you're speaking, you really have to use your lower register because if you talk like this, a lot of times they just look right, right past you. and It doesn't matter. You know, I'm like, Oh honey, I know that might be your natural voice, but it's so important. Like I'll hear people like, welcome to like the glasses breaking. I was like, oh, honey, no one's going to take you seriously. Or they get nervous, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? It's a tricky place because yeah. you want people, you don't want to, you don't want to do any voice shaming. You don't want people to feel like there's something wrong with them that they're not using their authentic voice. And yet there are things that women do with their voices that often mark them as less than, as you said before. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I, I do it too. I've heard people where I just go, oh, honey, you sound like a three-year-old. You're never going to get to where you want to get. You know, um, and, and I, I'm sorry, but it's important. And, and the way that you're perceived is when you're, when you're, when your instrument is rooted and you're there, you get more attention. Like if I'm going through a crowd, I go, excuse me, you know, and people are like, oh, and they get out of the way. But you're like, excuse me, excuse me. People just ignore you. So maybe that's an exercise people can, can try when they're out and about and want to get by someone, just use your lower register when you're trying to get through a crowd and watch how people will go away or whether they won't, you know, it's, it's, it's Sue, do you remember in college? I just, just flashed me. The answer is no, I don't remember anything. From gosh, we had the, um, the phones with the, the cord, corded phones for one, yeah. corded phones yeah. with the receiver. And when we were in voice class, I can remember, I don't know if we were told to do this or this, I, we were probably told to do this. When you answer the phone, which often you did back then when people called you, oh. that you'd go, hello. And so as we were learning to answer the phone, it's like, ah, hi, it's Jen, that you'd go, hello. And people on the other line would be like, is, is Jen there? <laughs> I was like, is it? It's me. It's me. Do you remember doing that at all? Yes, yeah, with so. the corded phones, man. Yeah, that was. A, it makes me think of. Um, there was a casting director in New York that I loved, uh, still do. Um, who knew my range, and she would be like, "I need your twenty-five year old." It's like, okay, great. Then we'll do a twenty-five year old. 
I want to know about the lactate. This is a hilarious story about the lactate cow commercial and your dad. Yeah. So I was the voice of the lactate cow. So my father, God bless him, who's very healthy at the time, wasn't. It was a pretty serious thing, but he's lying and they got him, you know, pretty drugged up. But for the most part, he's, you know, he's an engineer. And the lactate commercial came on and goes, that's my daughter. And the nurse is like, oh, she's like, you hear it? And she's like, uh-huh. Oh, and she's thinking like, the, the cow, oh, your daughter's cow. a cow. And she goes, not the cow, the voice of the cow. She's like, oh, oh. <laughs> like, thank God. We're like, uh-oh, maybe we got to send her to the psych ward. <laughs> I'm going to try to do these from memory, Sue. It's Progresso, Tide, obviously Swiffer was a big one in the early days. Uh, there's a hummus commercial. There's um, the lactate cow. I mean, loves. Oh, yep. It's 25 years. I don't know, you know. <laughs> they just too many to kill. <laughs> well, I want to. I want to post in our group some of those. I think your reels. We've probably got your reels somewhere. But can you? Um, is there a favorite? Oh, 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 yeah. My, I think my favorite was Swiffer because it was so good to me. Um, and it was for for those following along at home. Um, it was there was one where the new handheld Swiffer came out, and there was this woman dancing to the Devo song all around the house and Swiffing and all that stuff. And I was doing it in the house at 102 degree. Um, oh, but best director, so much fun. The crazier I got, the more they loved it. And most of the times when you, I get hired to do the comedic take where I'm on more director's reels because they're funny than I am on things that show up what the client chooses because they're things that are so, I and mean, I've never understood that. Like the Super Bowl commercials are all hilariously funny, but clients would get very nervous. But anyway, um, so Swiffer, yeah, that director was great. And then it ran and ran and ran. And uh, it was also mentioned in Goodnight Nobody by Jennifer Weiner um, saying that, you know, and I was like the crazy Swiffer lady, did it, you know, singing, cleaning to the Devo song. So I emailed her. I was like, hey, guess what? <laughs> I'm the Swiffer lady. She's like, oh my God, do you want to do the commercial for my next book? I was like, yeah. So I went to Philly. Oh, and like, that solidified my legacy, children. That's the legacy. <laughs> She was a cow. <laughs> I mean, just having this conversation with Susan is like having conversations every day with you in the sense that, for God's sakes, people, if you're looking to get a good rounded education at a theater minor, I mean, just listening to this conversation, you sit there and go, how do you start this conversation? You're entrepreneurs every day. Yeah. And I have a lot of friends who have you know, been aged out of a lot of roles who are now teaching, you know, and, and t doing improv and theatrical stuff to get people, they're going all over to all these, you know, businesses and, you know, I, hello, and, you know, teaching people that, that this applies to business more than you realize um, how you present yourself, how you sound, how you, you, know, how you stand. It should be required minor for business majors, uh, for everybody. But if you want to start with business, I just sit there and go, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I say that to my son all the time. now because all the kids are just, yeah. there's no interaction. There's no eye contact. There's no phone calls anymore. It, and so I, I think that the, the, uh, the landscape of business is going to be in trouble for a lot of the people who don't, uh, who aren't comfortable other people making eye contact i've had to tell kids if you don't want to look them in the eye just look at their eyebrow like just if you're too nervous mm -hmm. to look straight in the eye then look at their eyebrow they're like oh i can do that like okay good i'm gonna clip that out for instagram look at their <laughs> eyebrow there's a tip for you yeah, look at the yeah. eyebrow if you can't look at the eyes <laughs> when there's a lot of people who fear public speaking. It's one of the top fear. Like 75% of the population fears public speaking. I don't. You don't. Obviously. We I would. Know. I don't I get like, that. Really? Okay. But people do. Has there been a time in your career where you have felt nervous or insecure? And what are, and if so, I'm thinking auditions, but maybe there's some other time. Maybe as a business owner, what strategies have you used? What solutions can you offer to help people feel more confident in, yeah. in those nervous of, situations? Of course. Even, yeah. Uh, even if I was like called in front of the casting director saying, 
you're just going in for the call back because they know you and this is kind of just the director wants to introduce you to the client or something like that. I still get nervous. If you don't get nervous, then, you know, check your pulse because that's, that's, that's good. Um, I think what will help people who are afraid to speak in front of people, two things I would say is no one cares. No one's judging you. No one cares. They're, they're, pick one person in the audience that you're going to talk to. Then you're real. You're not presentational. And if you see, like, I'm only talking to one person, that might calm you down and not get so nervous. The other thing is change the nervousness into excitement. You know, don't label as, oh, I'm so nervous. Change the lens. I'm like, oh, I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm really, my, I'm happy that I have this opportunity, you know, and, and that happened to me too. When we, remember when we went to New York City, when we were like juniors or something or seniors, we all got to audition and stuff. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was, in, I was at a, I think it was Man of La Mancha or something, and I was freaking out, and really nervous. And a woman looked at me, and she could, she could tell. She's like, why are you nervous? And she knew I was young. You know, she could just tell, like, oh, this is puppy's first time in New York or whatever. And uh, she's like, you're nervous. I said, yeah, yeah. She goes, why are, why are you nervous? They're going to give you two minutes to let you do what you love to do. You got two whole minutes just to do what you love to do. So go do what you love to do. I was like, oh, you know, and I think for anyone who owns a business and who loves their business and who is proud of their business, this is your opportunity to go talk to somebody about something you love and something you're proud of. You don't get nervous saying, oh, I want to see my kid at the soccer game. <laughs> you know, you're not. Right. That, that's something you love and you're excited about. So translate that energy into something positive for yourself and just make it a different life Um experience of okay i'm not nervous i'm excited don't let your nerves or your or your brain uh talk you into or make it make you believe it's something else it's because when you're not fully present and you're more concerned about what you're saying and how they're receiving it versus how you're saying it so they can really hear it and understand it that needs to be the priority not how you're presenting yourself so much i know that sounds like a argument in itself of like don't worry about what you're saying or how you say it that's like weird i'm trying to get my thought of um let the nerves go and focus instead on on your nerves focus on what you have to say i noticed you have gotten on instagram and you've been doing some reels and some tips for your business and putting it on youtube okay so it's very different it's different than live theater it's different than comedy it's different than being doing a commercial for one you have to be yourself you're not a character there, for two, it's digital. Like there's a lot, it's social, all the things. So I don't have any answers, but I want to know from you, what's it been like to turn the camera on and do two minutes of a reel or a tip for your business? Okay. Here's the thing. Fine with it. Totally fine with it. I just don't like the machine algorithm likes followers who's the prettiest, you know? Um, and I, have made the decision to relieve myself of any pressure, anxiety, uh, fear of judgment, and be absolutely authentic. Because when I watch the Instagram reels of other people, I panic, I get overwhelmed. I'm like, I have time to floss. Never mind, put up all my white Christmas trees next to my pink Christmas. Like, I, I, I can't. No one can attain that unless you have a team and unless you have like time and a maid and a driver and a chef and a, I mean, it's true. What, what is done out there is so unattainable. And it makes me think of like when we were young, how, well, even now, how uh, fashion magazines and, you know, finally they're having people with real bodies out there you know i remember we were all i was on diet pills when i was like eighth grade thinking i'm fat you know my mother's like ah, you know and that was not i was not i mean i had bulimic friends all that stuff. so i think how i'm dealing with instagram and it seems to be really helping me is i do it oh i do my reels my tuesday tips um because sometimes it's all i have time for amen you know? like i'm sorry I can't show you every product and try to sell it on Instagram. I've got five design clients. I got three dogs. I got a filthy house. I got a shop to run. Um, and maybe I can work out 
just going to say. But so I decided to, when I do my, my Tuesday tips, I do it in one take. And if I flub, I flub, you know, and people have come into the shop and people, anybody who um, has followed me, I try to thank every single follower personally. I'll write a, a note. Um, and they're like, oh my God, I love your Tuesday tips. I'm like, oh, thanks. Like, you're so funny. I'm like, hey, you spelled crazy wrong. Another thing that I learned doing commercials and voiceovers for so long, there is only one you. There's only one you. Your DNA is yours. Your fingerprint, your, you, there's only one you. So trying, why would you want to try to conform when you're so unique yourself? Just being you. I've gotten more respect for being my authentic self, being flawed, you know, not being perfect. Because if I get anxiety looking at all the Instagram and everybody who's perfect and stuff like that, I know that people who aren't comfortable in front of the camera are going to you know, so you do you, you know, and, and my mother used to say, you need a little F off juice, you know, one time when I wasn't standing up for myself and she put a label on the orange juice, the, the off juice, you need a little juice, you know, because it doesn't matter what, what people, what other people think of you is not everything, you know, and I think that frees people up into maybe sliding into what they're comfortable I totally agree. And it's it's so hard for the younger generations because they don't really even know who they are yet. So they're trying to fit. They don't know what their unique fingerprint is. So they're trying to stab at whatever branding they can come up with. But here's here's the thing. Like when I'm doing with a meeting with a design client, they may not know what they want the same way a teenager doesn't know who they are. But people know what they don't. Want. So maybe kids out there can think, well, I know I don't want to do that or be that. I know I don't want to do that or be that. And then you'll narrow it down and you'll maybe be triggered to find or excited to explore your uniqueness and knowing that who you aren't leads you to who you are the same way what you don't like for design leads you to, you know, me to, to do things for my clients to figure out what they do want, what they do. Yeah. Want. Good, good, good. Good, good times, good uh, it's process of elimination plans for sure. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. Right, because everybody gets overwhelmed by like, I don't know what I'm going to, okay, we'll figure out what you don't want yeah. first. Whether it's a guy or a girl or a house or a dog or your career, go with what you don't want first. Because I tell my design class, the more no's I get leads me to, yes, you're not going to hurt my ceiling feelings if you go like, that is the ugliest lamp I've ever seen. I'm like, that's great because that leads me to where you want to to figure out what you want because I'm not a mind reader. So yeah, figure out, figure out what you, what you don't. So. All right. We have kept you so long and you have a big, a big event in Marblehead tonight. Don't you, you have a big uh, holiday. Yeah. It's the first night of Christmas walk. It's like a, it's like a Hallmark movie. Oh, stop. Yeah. yeah. All right, listen, Sue, we're going to send you back to the green room. This has been amazing. I have always loved connecting with you when we've been in New York together. And I'm sorry I haven't seen you in person more, but love you lots. Love you guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And listen to these two. This is my cookie. <laughs> or something. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is my ideal podcast. Yes. And we can't wait to visit Marvelhead one day soon. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Speak With Presence podcast, and we will see you next time. Right, JRT? That's right. I'll hold suspicion for what's next. All right. Peace out. All right. See you later. Marblehead is a drinking town with a sailing problem. Gotcha. So everyone enjoys a nice pool. A nice pool? A nice pool? A nice pool. P-O-U-R. A nice pool. The Marblehead pool. You make a stiffy. Love it. I'm gonna get myself a pour in my hot chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Says the Kansas girl. Yeah. I'm Jen Belenga, and this is Speak with Presence. And this one over here is JRT, who's gonna go get a pour in my hot cocoa <laughs> later today. Keep your day job. <laughs>